So CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, you know that CPR is when you do CPR on someone when they don't have a pulse and respirations. And it should be the backward. They don't have respirations or they don't have a pulse. Right? Because it's always A, B, C. Airway, open the airway, right? Check, make sure they have a patent or open the airway. Check to see if they're breathing. If they're not breathing, check the pulse for 10 seconds. If they don't have a pulse, then begin chest compressions. So it's always the ABCs. When we look at this, however, sudden cardiac arrest, this is the way most people go into cardiac arrest, unless they're on hospice or something like that. If I, I don't choose to go into cardiac arrest, right? So I'm not going to say, oh, I'm going to go into cardiac arrest today. So I, I pick that out for myself, right? I, so it's going to be sudden, unexpected, and that's the way most of the case is. As you guys know from, from working in the hospital, being in the hospital probably last year, that most of the time when a person goes into sudden cardiac arrest, or here, you know, the SCA, as no warning, most of the time it's pre-hospital, what we're talking about, they go into cardiac arrest at home, uh, the majority of people go into cardiac arrest in the mornings. Like I was telling you the other day, that's what you guys miss out by going to clinical at 9 o'clock. Because everybody's stressed about their day, they don't like their jobs, they get up, they have a fight with their wife, they kick their dog, you know, they, uh, their children don't want to eat breakfast, they're all stressed out, and they're already stressed out from the job that they don't like, and so they start having chest pain, heart's not getting enough oxygen, and it stops and they go into sudden cardiac arrest. It's like on the TV when you see someone clutching your chest and they go, Ugh, right, and hit the ground. This is what they're talking about here. Uh, 95, just so I'll throw this out there, 95% of all uh, cardiac arrest end in death. So you don't have to feel too bad about your resuscitative efforts if the patient goes ahead and dies, right? I mean, you do what you can. That's all, peop that, that's all they can ask you to do, right? Do the best you can. Do what you're trained to do to try to resuscitate the patient. You can't ask for more than that. Just keep in mind that most people, once the heart stops, they die from that. And it's not, it's not good, right? But it's just a fact of life. It's something that you guys who are in health care, going into health care, are going to have to get it used to. You're going to have to get a grip on that people are going to die. All right? And they're going to die all around you. Not too much you can do about it, except do your job. Like I said, a huge number out of hospital, 300,000 a year. Uh, really, when you look at, when we talk about EMS, and we're going in, we don't talk a lot about the, the different calls and the different things. Cardiac arrest is not the big call. It's not a hard thing to treat the patient for. Even at an advanced life support level, it's not hard to do. Most people think, oh, that's the ultimate call, the CPR. Really, the, the uncontrolled chest pain or the respiratory problem is the most difficult call. The most easiest is the trauma, typically. Trauma is really easy to treat for. This, you, you do compressions, you breathe for them. On my end, I'd give them some drugs, try to restart their heart. So it's, it's not that difficult. You just sort of have to stay uh, in control of it. So this is what happens when someone goes into cardiac arrest. What takes place is from that block, blockage or whatever it is that's stopping the blood flow or decreasing the blood flow where the heart's not getting enough oxygen, it's going to get irritated. And when the heart gets irritated... That's when you start having the chest pain that we spoke about last year, that you guys have hopefully talked about last year. You talked about someone having chest pain, having a heart attack. You've got to have oxygen. You, gotta, you have to have oxygen to any muscle, right? You know, if you run down the hall and you're not used to running and then you're, you're depriving that, your legs of oxygen, you're going to have some pain in your legs due to the lack of oxygen. This is no different. But what happens here with sudden cardiac arrest is due to the lack of oxygen and that blockage start going into the patient starts going into ventricular fibrillation. That should sound familiar, right? V fib? Everybody understand V fib? Remember the uh, it's one of the shockable rhythms in cardiac arrest. The other shockable rhythm is V tac. 
Uh, but we'll focus mainly on B-fib. This is the most common rhythm that the patient goes in when they, when they go into cardiac arrest. And it's essentially the heart is sitting in the cavity like it says quivering. It's doing this like a gazillion times a minute. It's just sitting there quivering. And it's not pumping, right? There's no pumping action there. It's a lethal rhythm because of how it's not pumping any blood out. It's just sitting there quivering. So in order to fix that, the, the really the, the primary cure for that is what? What do we need to do? Huh? Dump it. Right, defibrillate. We need to defibrillate it. What happens here when they go into cardiac arrest, and you're right, they have to defibrillate it. See how this works? This would be a trick. Ventricular fibrillation. Ain't that cool? So it looks like this, right? It's this sort of chaotic, weird looking rhythm that comes up. Uh, there's no coordination to it at all. The, it's just sitting there quivering in the, the chest. What takes place when we defibrillate, like with the AED, you've got ventricular fibrillation. You guys on the AED won't see this on the monitor. To, to recognize that and interpret that rhythm is an advanced life support thing. You, eventually you will be able to. It's not very difficult, ECG recognition. But so when you look at that, you have ventricular fibrillation. What, now we said the goal is to defibrillate it. What does the defibrillator do? Y'all remember that? Shocks it and then, huh? Exactly. So. We have this ventricular fibrillation here, and then we want this. We want a straight line. What is that? Yeah, so they have no pulse. Y'all remember the name of the rhythm? A. A. Asystole, right. No pumping. A without systolic or systole is the pumping or the contraction phase. So asystole. This is asystole. The goal in defibrillation is to put the patient in asystole or a flat line. And you're right. You have to stop the heart. You have to stop the electrical pattern of the heart in order to get it restarted. After this, what the goal is, what we hope to take place, is that the... Uh, properties of the cardiac cell will take over. The intrinsic properties of the cardiac cell will take over. That would be a big bonus. The three properties of a cardiac cell. Anybody remember that? Start with an A. Automaticity, right. Good, that's good. So, excitability, uh, in order, excitability, automaticity, and contractility. With that cell within itself, the property within the cardiac cell, the, the cardiac cell would, it will ex, has the ability to excite itself or to create an action potential. From that action potential, it will automatically do that. It has automaticity, means automatically will do that, and then it contracts. Really cool. What we want to do, we have this line of asystole. So we stopped it, and now we have this, uh, the properties of the cardiac cell, excitability, automaticity, contractility, right? And now we want this to return to something that looks some similar to this. Right? Probably a little bit better drawing, but that, that's somewhat of a normal rhythm, correct? Remember what this is, this part? Like what it is or what it's called? What this part, yeah, what's this called? P wave, right? And what does the P wave represent? Right, the S8 node depolarization. What's this other part right here? 
uh, right here. So this is the P. Q R S. And what is that? <laughs> you know, scribble a little. What is that? What does that represent? You're right, ventricular depolarization, or it should represent contraction of the ventricles. And then this, this part here, is the T wave, and that's ventricular repolarization, right? So you get that. So that's what we want to happen from that uh, ventricular fibrillation. We want to stop the heart, have the automatic properties of the heart itself to kick in and start creating the the rhythm, and hopefully this will have a pulse along with it, right? If it doesn't, if that doesn't happen, we stop it and the patient stays in a systole, that's where you need advanced life support. Because I would come along or a paramedic would come along or somebody and start giving them epinephrine. And remember, epinephrine is used to excite those, part of the properties of epinephrine is to excite those cardiac cells. So when you give the epinephrine, its job is to excite those cardiac cells and trying to get them to fire. So when they start depolarizing, or you get that action potential in that cardiac cell, that cell will start to depolarize. So you pump them full of epinephrine on the advanced life support. So that will help you a little bit along down the way with that whole, uh, what is it, that, circle, not that circle of life, but that decision tree thing, huh? You know what I'm talking about? No. Yeah, we'll get to it in a minute. I don't either. Uh, where you take the plan of action, steps of action, I don't know. Chain of, chain of survival, there you go. Thanks. Old moment there. So you get that chain of survival. So we talked about that. Uh, goes into ventricular fibrillation. The result is the blood flow stops. Once the blood flow stops, you have seconds of consciousness. So once the blood flow stops flowing, that patient, that person will only stay conscious for a second or so, and then they're going to pass out because of lack of oxygen to the brain. But you remember here, time is crucial, right? Time is very crucial without oxygen. Six to ten minutes is what? After 6, 10, 6 to 10 minutes? Biological death. Right. Once the heart stops, immediately, yeah, good. Immediately when the heart stops, it's clinical death. So you have clinical death. As soon as the heart stops, biological death that occurs uh, 6 to 10 minutes later. 6 to 10, a lot of people say 10. If I'm down for six minutes without oxygen, don't resuscitate me. Brain's mush. All right. So the uh, so and also biological death after ten minutes is called irreversible. Now they may get the heart rate back, right? They may pump enough epinephrine in there to get that heart to contract, but it's irreversible after ten minutes, unless you're frozen. Is uh, irreversible death. Know, like if you fall in a frozen lake or something. And that's sort of a special category. Now, what the CPR does, which we have to take the CPR, and you have to start CPR very quickly, is it temporarily starts blood flow if you do the compressions, right, just to the heart and to the brain. That's the only thing the body's worried about. Your kidneys and your gut, your feet, your hands are not receiving any blood. It's just your heart and brain. You start compressions, and it starts pumping that blood from your heart to your head, just in sort of a, a cycle effect like that. None of your other organs are getting anything. It is very important to start CPR uh, as soon as you can, as soon as you recognize the patient's in cardiac arrest. And like we already talked about as well, it is very important to... Make sure that you defibrillate the patient as soon as you can. Two minutes or so after cardiac arrest, you get uh, the, the probability 
of a successful defibrillation goes down uh, quite a bit. Yeah. So the, the thing that we need to do the best, the quickest, is to defibrillate them. You essentially have about two minutes. That's why there's AEDs everywhere now. They want you to defibrillate as soon as possible. That's because you have the greater chance of survival if you defibrillate the patient within the first two minutes. After about two minutes, you, you start decreasing your percentage time. And then we look at here, and time is very crucial. It drops essentially 10% per minute. Your survivability drops 10% every minute that CPR is not performed. So you start out, if you start out and you believe, like most people believe, that CPR, perfect compressions, is only about 30% effective. All right? And you start out there and you're doing 30% of what the heart would normally do, all right? and then you add time in there, and then age, and then past medical history, the ch you can sort of see why they have a 95% non-resuscitation rate, right? It's not that, that you guys, the young people fall out, have these heart attacks, most or, and go into sudden cardiac arrest, it's, it's old people. And so they have a 70, 80 year old heart or engine inside of them that you're trying to, trying to restart. It's incredibly hard to restart the heart in, in someone like a geriatric patient. It's, it's very difficult because the muscles well used. It'd be like having an 80 year old car and the engine, something wrong with the engine, right? Try to fix an 80 year old engine? Not gonna be very, not gonna be very easy, is it? The other thing that goes along with, it's very crucial to start the CPR, we remember what, uh, CPP, right? We don't want CPP, but we CPP, you may remember that. Mm -hmm. I remember, is it the coronary perfusion pressure? Right, the coronary perfusion pressure. You've got to keep the coronary perfusion pressure up. As soon as you stop, as soon as the heart stops, the pressure starts to start priming the pump again if you don't keep the coronary perfusion pressure up. That's why later, just sort of look at the uh, just compression only CPR. They're teaching that because nobody in their right mind does mouth to mouth anymore. Uh, every one of you guys, as far as infection control is concerned, in my mindset, you have AIDS. You know, I wouldn't do mouth-to-mouth -mouth on anybody except my immediate family, the people I knew their past medical history of. Besides that, it's not happening. And, and that's what... So in this, we teach a health care provider. So here, we're, we're used to bag valve masks. I, I don't even teach... Even when I teach outside, I don't teach mouth to mouth. You use some sort of barrier device or just do uh, hands free. We'll look at the AED in a little while. We'll, we'll break it out and practice with it. These things are great. When they came out, no telling how many thousands of lives they've saved because they're so available right now. I think we have three or four just in the school. There's one down the hall just in case I go into sudden cardiac arrest. You can run down there and get the AED for me. Keep everybody else away from me. Y'all just put it on for him. You'll you get payback, right? Oh, I want to shock him. You know? But the, it's very easy to use. In some states, you have to be uh, CPR and AED trained in order to get your driver's license renewed. You can't, get, you can't drive. Up north, you can't drive on the streets uh, with, without knowing how to use the AED. It's so simple, most people know how to use it. And even if you don't know how to use it, the, there's instructions on the inside, there's pictures. Even if you don't know how to read, all you got to do is look at the pictures. So we'll look at this AED and we'll figure out how to look at that because uh, you have two different types. You have an automatic external defibrillator that does everything automatic. All you have to do is turn it on, put the pads on, and stand back. 
It does everything automatically. It will shock automatically. You don't even have to push the button. You just have to turn it on. The kind that we're going to be practicing with is a semi-automatic defibrillator, which all that means is you have to push the button. It's still going to tell you what to do. It's going to have voice prompts telling you what to do. You just have to push the button. An automatic defibrillator will uh, defibrillate. So what we look at here, we've got to look at the, the, the probability of survival, survivability. So if we want the patient to survive the, the arrest, so uh, CPR, early CPR, early defibrillation, call 911. And again, in these chain of survival things that you look at, uh, early 911, early recognition, early 911, early CPR, early defibrillation, early advanced life support, get them to the hospital, integrate all this together. Now where you guys are going to play, uh, where this is going to become most important to you is on your National Registry exam. On the National Registry exam, a lot of the cardiac section, which is a huge section of the exam, deals with CPR. Your scenarios are going to be CPR based. They want to make sure that you know how to do this. So, and you have to, in those scenario type questions, you have to see where you are in this chain of survival. So make sure that you commit that chain of survival to memory. It'll be very important for you later. Anytime when you miss any of these links, everything sort of goes astray. It does no good. Here, look, you call 911, you start CPR, but you don't have an AED. So the, the probability of a successful resuscitation drops drastically when any of these chains are broken. We don't make assumptions, right? No assumptions. So don't assume someone else is calling 911. Make sure that you assign someone to call 911. It does no good to jump down there and do CPR and defibrillate them if an ambulance is not coming. The confusing part in the EMT portion of this, remember, you are 911. All right. So when you do your CPR scenarios, don't call 911. That's you. You would call for advanced life support, but you wouldn't necessarily call for 911. Everything is done by age groups, the, especially the CPR and, and the AED. We're getting to each different age groups. The CPR is essentially the same. It's just sort of the way that you do it. The defibrillation is different. You have to have a AED, or I mean a pediatric, uh, oh, what's it called, an adapter, in order to defibrillate the 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 pediatrics with the AED. When we look at this, you have a someone less than a year is considered an infant. Year to the onset of puberty, uh, what's that, 12, 13, is considered a child, and above that is considered an adult. Now with the bag valve mask, you want to make sure, when we practice the bag valve mask, you want to make sure that you have the same size. You have an adult, but you have a small adult that might need a, a smaller bag or a smaller mask. All the masks are interchangeable, and when we get up and practice, we'll look at that. Now, Cardiac arrest in children, very rare. Usually it deals with a drowning, deals with trauma, it deals with something that's already taken place. Maybe they have a bad heart from birth, they have some sort of birth defect there. Uh, it is Most of the time, when you look at uh, CPR in at a child or an infant, it's dealing with something with respiratory. The majority of times, that I've done CPR on babies. Uh, either they've just been sick from birth, like it was a, a birth thing, they were sick from birth, or like a suffocation. Very important to remember, when you guys have children, don't sleep with your children. Don't sleep with your babies. Everybody wants to cuddle up with their babies and sleep with their babies, you know, right? You roll over on them. You're in the bed, you're sort of holding the baby, everything, you know, oh, ain't this nice, blah, blah, blah. 
And then the baby falls asleep, and you're so tired from having a baby, you fall asleep. And what do you do? You roll over. And they become a pillow. Exactly. You roll over on top of them. It may sound funny, but it's very tragic. You roll over on top of them, and you suffocate the baby. I've seen it uh, twice in one week. It was a bad week for me. Uh, One, the dad suffocated the baby. The second one, a sibling suffocated the baby. So the, uh, it, it's, it's very common. You just can't, even though it's nice to do, the parents are very, very tired and all that, you just can't sleep with the babies. You gotta, that's why you have a crib or out of a bed. Their heart, without oxygen, children, infants and children respond greatly to oxygen. Pediatric uh, emergency, pediatric and cardiac arrest. So give them the oxygen. Tell you, without that, heart rate slows down. Once the pediatric, once the infant or child's heart starts to slow down, it slows down quickly, and then it, then it stops. It is incredibly hard to get back uh, going again. It's essentially done the same way. The methods and everything on a child is done the same way. We'll look at that a little bit more when we get into uh, pediatric and child CPR. Uh, the biggest difference is that you you would only be careful. You'd be careful with the compressions. They're small, so you typically use one hand, and then you instead of using a full head tilt chin lift, you would keep them in a sniffing position or a neutral position. It's pretty much the the uh, own difference. I mean, y'all remember the difference in the anatomy from last year, right? On the on the pediatric anatomy. And then care, prevention, look at that on that chain of survival. Prevention in a pediatric is, is the key. We've got to, and when you guys get out into medicine and you start, you know, working as nurses and doctors and whatever, part of your responsibility as that provider is education. So we have to educate the public a lot on their children. So the, uh, don't let them swim in water that you can't see in. You know, everybody likes to go swimming in the lake. They like to let their kids swim in the lake. You can't see the water. So what happens if they get tied up and something pulls them under the, you know, they get tied up in a fishing line or all the other junk that's in the bottom of the lake. And they get pulled in. And you notice you're, you're trying to be a good parent. You're watching them. But they get pulled under. But you can't see them, right? Because in Texas, you can't see the bottom of the lake. It's got mud, mud legs. So now they're pulled under. Now you can't see where they're at. And when you jump in the water to start trying to find them, you move that body all over the place. That body just, it's a cork now. The body, I hate to say it like that, but the body's essentially a cork, and it starts to move in that water all over the place. That's the number one reason you can't find drowning victims. Everybody jumps in the water, and they start moving the body out. You don't believe me, get, uh, get in, the, in, the th- in the pool, throw something and submerge it halfway, and then everybody jump in and see where that thing goes. So it, it just goes everywhere. You can't see it. Prevention and trauma, wear the seat belts, wear your helmet when you're on a four-wheeler. So a lot of things here, we talk about prevention. When we go over the pediatric aspect of that, We'll talk about does that. As we talked a lot last year, this year we're talking even more. Your safety, paramount. Scene safety. Over and over. All your skills that you'll be doing in here, first thing you'll do is like, I got BSI, scene safe. It's the scene safe. Do not go anywhere where the scene is not safe. Whose responsibility is to do get scene safety. Huh? Who's whose responsibility is it to make the scene safe? Police. You're a healthcare provider. The police, the people with the gun and the taser, 
Did y'all happen to see that on the news last night? They tased that guy. It's pretty cool looking. Dropped him like a sack of rocks. But the, uh, the police makes the scene safe. We will beat that in your heads all throughout the EMT portion of this to make sure that the scene is safe. You don't go anywhere where the scene is not safe. The patient could be bleeding to death over and across the hall in the bathroom. And if that scene is not safe, then I'm staying right here. What's going to happen to the patient? They're going to die. What's going to happen with me? I'm going to live. Okay? It's, it's not worth the trade-off. Okay? I tell you, in trauma, however, because most trauma patients die. So you've got to keep in mind that your objective, when if you, you know, we're talking, we're focusing on pre-hospital medicine, your objective is to go home safe. Your objective is not to have someone go up to your family in the middle of the night knocking on their door and say, hey, we need to talk to you. Right? So you've got to make sure that that scene is safe. I've been into a lot of places where it's become unsafe and I've got out of there. Forget that patient. I'm, I'm hitting the road. You know, I'm waiting till the police are there. The police and EMS work very well together. You've you got to remember that. We always want to... This says pause first, and that's a great thing. It's that I tell everybody, if you see an emergency responder running towards you, now remember that? I'm sure I told you that last year. What do you do? You run the other way, exactly. Because they are out of control. I don't know an emergency responder that runs that's any good. It's worth their weight in anything. You may walk briskly, but you're pausing enough to take everything in. Remember, size up. You get that good size up going on, you walk. It's not your emergency. You want to pause. You want to look. Make sure the scene is safe. Make sure there's not anything that's going to hurt you and make you another patient, right? So, very important. Pause, look around, look for hazards, look for unsafe things. Uh, and if it's not safe, get out. Because right? you want to go home. The thing about it is, So let's look at this. Disease transmission, that's why we wear gloves. And that's why if we don't suck face, we suck face through a mask. All right? Through a barrier device. Gloves, you never want to expose yourself to blood. You want to make sure that, like if your neck was bleeding right now, and you had blood spurting out of your neck, and I'm like, you might want to hold that. I'm not touching it. Right? I'm not exposing my hands because I could have small cuts on my hands, which I'll probably do. The best way to find that is yeah, hand it out. Yeah, like, ooh, there's one. You know, but I said, you probably want to hold that. You know, because but I'm not going to risk that exposure. So, I mean, it's crucial that you have gloves on, that you, you uh, avoid the exposure of any kind of body fluid. All body fluids are infectious uh, to me. I look at any sort of Thing like that. Hepatitis B is a killer. It affects the liver. Hepatitis C also affects the liver. The difference here between HIV and AIDS and the hepatitis 
is the hepatitis lives outside the host much longer. So if there's blood splatter or something, and a person has hepatitis, that blood is going to live much longer. The hepatitis blood is going to live much longer than AIDS. AIDS will not, the, uh, the disease will not live outside the host very long. It's going to die quickly once it hits the, the surface. I don't know the times. The times are not really that important. This, you just have to remember that the AIDS thing is the biggest, I mean the hepatitis is much more uh, contagious than the AIDS as far, as far as doing harm to the provider. So always use the universal precautions. We know the gloves. We know the, the barrier devices already. Uh, we'll show you some CPR type masks here in just a, just a few minutes, okay? Then, of course, you use disposable gloves, like uh, latex gloves. There's the CPR mask. They're very good. I'll break one out in just a second and demo it to you. Uh, if you had to use a barrier device, this would be the, probably the, the minimum barrier device that I would use would be a CPR mask. They make a face shield that I'm going to show you that I wouldn't use. We, we uh, affectionately term it, uh, call it a vomit deflector. Because in CPR, when you're doing CPR on someone, it's not if they vomit, it's when they vomit. They're going to vomit. And it's that CPR vomit. It stinks much worse than, it's death vomit. So it stinks much worse than just regular French fry vomit. So nobody recommends in, in their right mind to do any sort of CPR uh, <clears throat> or anything without barrier devices when we start looking at that. <clears throat>